sport has the power to change the world. After huge anticipation, one of sport's hottest tickets kicked off in May as the annual series of Laureus South Africa sports themed breakfast, hosted by Mercedes Benz, took place in Santon to explore the cycling world. The coffee was hot, the fare on offer simply outstanding, and the high octane event expertly marshaled by the voice of cycling in South Africa, none other than Gerald Koch. Also, this episode, we finally, somehow, managed to nail down the rugby live wire that is Skulk Brits. The hooker from the Western Cape, with the sidestep of a Fijian outside back, brought the curtain down on his illustrious career with victory in the Premiership final with Saracens in late May. Or at least, that's what he told the rugby world and his family. Well, we'll speak to Skulk from deep within the Springbok camp of all places for a remarkable tale that's probably in keeping with the man himself. I'm John Smythe. Thank you for listening, downloading and subscribing to the series. And remember to find us on Twitter, Facebook and on Instagram. Welcome to the show. Well, we kick off this week with a chilly, high-felt morning spent at the Mercedes-Benz dealership in Santon talking all things cycling. From elite mountain biking and road racing to the sport at the development level. This was the first in our series of sporting themed breakfasts that will take place across the country and have become a highlight on the calendar. Not only have these breakfasts become renowned for exclusive insights from some of the respective sports most important voices, but just as importantly, they facilitate a platform for the projects that we're involved with to highlight the world that they live in. A packed dealership saw ambassadors Natalie de Toy, Grant Lottering and Dacian Daisel all in attendance, while the likes of Cindy Ross from Deep Squirt Mountain Bike Academy were all on hand to offer their key insights. But nowhere else to start then with a word from our incredible partners, Mercedes-Benz South Africa, where Ebe Khotle, the Executive Director of Human Resources, highlights just why this partnership is so important. Well, I mean, uh, Lorias is one of our flagship uh, programs that we participate in, and uh, this is uh, extremely important to us. Development of young people in particular is something that we hold very, very dearly, and therefore, the, you know, this relationship with Lorias makes uh, perfect sense to, uh, to us as Mercedes-Benz South Africa. It's, uh, these breakfasts particularly connect you with, with, with everyone, I suppose, the projects, Lorias, and, and your clients. In, indeed, and uh, it uh, it gives us the opportunity to really get to feel, uh, you know, the impact, especially with the beneficiaries of the projects, the impact that the program, that the different programs have uh, on their day-to-day lives, and of course also create an opportunity for us to meet and network with a lot more uh, people and hopefully spread the good news about the work that Lorias is doing and get as many of us as possible involved in uh, Lorias. Well, our array of panelists included the likes of Jenny Stienerhag, former winner of the Absa Cape Epic, Carol Austin, the head of performance support and medical at Team Dimension Data for Quebecer, Lisa Ulefier, who's the marketing manager for Quebecer, who are doing incredible work in their endeavor to change lives through bicycles, and then a young man whose life has changed on two wheels, top young mountain biker and Laureus Yes graduate, William Mokopo, who came through the Deep Skirt Mountain Bike Academy. Let's hear from them now as they spoke to Gerald afterwards. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, defend my title this year because uh, I had an accident about two weeks before the race and uh, I tore my hamstring muscle off the bone and uh, had to go through with a, quite a complicated surgery. And um, yeah, it's taken me quite a few months to get back on the bike, but uh, I am back on the bike now, so just looking forward. That's a serious injury and you had a, a fairly serious heart condition a couple of years ago as well. What sort of um, mindset do you have to have to come back and focus and get back into racing? Yeah, it's obviously tough to get back the whole time and I've had quite a few more injuries also and uh, keep having to come back. And uh, But I'm just, uh, I just love this sport so much and I just want to do it and it keeps me motivated. And I think to get back from an injury, the best thing to do is to focus on getting back to top sport because then you do everything you can for that injury to heal. 
Well, I think our team wouldn't be where it is right now if we hadn't brought all the science in right up front. So from 2008, when I joined the team, we brought state-of-the-art technology into the team, SRM power meters. Um, we train the riders according to scientific approaches. We've always employed coaches that are sports scientists. And we've worked our way up from being a national level team through to being a world tour team. So can it be applied? Absolutely. It's, I, I would say it's even more fundamentally important to do it when you're living in an isolated community and you don't have access to the direct competition. So you can't go out on the weekends and actually race against the level. You should be racing. You can then use the data, I guess, to benchmark the performance levels and the training levels that you need to um, be stepping up to. So it's, uh, without a doubt, I think it can be brought back. With cycling, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, at a younger age just to develop basic skills. So that's one of our challenges still with our team right now is our guys struggle to descend quickly enough in Europe. And um, yeah, I mean, that can cause you to win or lose the race and it can cause you to actually drop off the back of the race. So I think the skills development and the tactical knowledge and understanding, and it's been incredible over those 10 years, just seeing now how much access we have to television footage. And I just am so grateful to our media partners and in, in South Africa that now we can really seal the races because these young kids can start seeing at a, a very early age what is going on and, and how the race plays out, which um, wasn't accessible back back in the day. <laughs> yeah, we've done 83,000 and we honestly believe that through the Real Bicycle Company, which is a social enterprise fully owned by Quebecer that will reshore bicycle manufacturing, we'll be doing hopefully that a year, if not more, in the not too far distant future. What are the sort of immediate challenges that, that Quebec faces? I think we're fairly lucky. We have been fairly lucky. We had a really good funding year last year, one of the best that we've had. To implement ethically is challenging if you want to make the program sustainable. I mean, it's not a bike dump. We literally, it's from um, assembling the bicycles to safety tra training for the beneficiaries and then training a mechanic in the area and making sure there's a supply chain to actually fix these bicycles. So to keep that going, to find partners on the ground, we have wonderful implementation partners, luckily, but it but it is part of I mean, short term future, <laughs> first things first, finish my degree. Then, um, I, I mean, my, my, my training is going well. Um, everything has been restructured, and we, I can see the, the improvement. I mean, I, I haven't been in a South African Coast County top 10, and it was the first time I get top 10 last month. So, that, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a change, and I can find comfort in that, that I'll still grow to be um, a very good cyclist. And, I mean, yeah, South African championships around the corner, and maybe world championships, and again, maybe in the future also try and get a team together and yeah, support each other. On the 26th of May, Saracens continued their recent domination of English Rugby's Premiership as they dispatched the Exeter Chiefs 27-10 in the final at Twickenham. It also brought the curtain down on the career of Skulk Brits who was described by some as the best foreign player to ever grace the league. The 37-year-old effervescent South African was to many a player who characterized the simple joys of the game, who possessed feet quicker than a Magimix at full speed, but who split opinion in the international fold due to a perceived lack of size. And to be fair, a relatively decent set of other hooking options available to the Springbok coach at the time. Brits was capped 10 times for the box but his value as a squad member was always revered and he played a key part in that regard at the World Cup in 2015. The praise after his final game was effusive and he bowed out as he entered the fray, smiling broadly. And so Brits jetted off to Ibiza with his family before heading to South Africa where he watched the pulsating first test between England and South Africa at Ellis Park as a fan. The Pyrosport podcast had agreed with Brits, who's a Laureus ambassador, for an interview, which he enthusiastically agreed to, but then it all went worryingly quiet until we eventually tracked him down, where it seems he spoke to us from under a hotel breakfast table in Bloemfontein. Incredibly, Brits was now a member of the Springbok squad for the incoming test series against England. Um, congratulations on a career that in theory ended two weeks ago, but is <laughs> is now 
continuing. Um, my original question to you after the final and, and when you spent some time in Ibiza with your family was, how do you feel mentally? But I suppose the question still stands. How do you feel mentally at the moment, considering how your life flipped around? I mean, for me, it was firstly amazing just having some time with the family. I, and, I thought, and I thought it would be amazing just to have some family time. Now things have changed around quite a bit. The mind, the body feels fantastic. It's weird. I shouldn't be feeling like I'm feeling at the moment at 37, but it is. I think I'm feeling better now than I was when I was 32. So things has evolved. But after this uh, test match this week and next week, we'll reassess and see um, what the future holds. Sure. And I mean, just from a timeline perspective, you win the Premiership with Saracens yet again. You then go on a well-deserved break to Ibiza, like I said. I think uh, one of your sons or your son cracks his head open, so that's stressful. You head out to South Africa, yeah. golf day, go to Ellis Park to watch the test as a spectator. And the following day, you called into the squad. I mean, by, by whirlwind standards, that's, that's a hurricane. Well, yes, John. I, I was actually having a couple of mojitos with the missus on the balcony when I got a text message from Rusty. Firstly, I, I thought someone was pulling my leg. I took a couple of text messages and I, I actually phoned Vincent Koch and said, Vincent, is it you that's, that's teasing me? And then I asked for Rusty's contact details and he sent that over and it matched with the number and I thought, oh, this can't be true. And I was just by chance, I was in South Africa, we building a house in Sunnenbosch and went down to have a look at everything that was going according to plan and then entertained some friends in, in, in Johannesburg, showed them around and then, yeah. I joined the squad on Sunday. It was literally getting dressed at the airport in Swimbo Gear and flew with the boys to Bloemfontein. Incredible story. Listen, good luck uh, for next week. And I, I know that you'll thoroughly enjoy just being part of the environment. I want to ask you just, if we can pull it back to pre-retirement retirement. If you can, if you can reflect a little bit, just in terms of the career, your, your, your nearly two decades as a pro. And, and I'm really interested, you know, considering what people make of you as a player. I mean, Stephen Jones has been incredibly effusive in his praise of you in terms of the impact he had on the Premiership. What do you think of yourself when you watch replays of you playing? Is it is it obvious to you, like it is to all of us, that you stand out in a different way on the field? Um, I've always tried to evolve the hooker position. But for me, it was always, uh, from, a, from a rugby perspective, how much can I learn from everybody, from centres to wings, uh, other hookers. Uh, and I've always had the mindset of, of, of learning. You know, if a, if a guy gives me a hard time on the scrum, uh, I want to know how he did it. And I think that's well, that's one of the secrets of for playing this long in this game, is, is f- firstly being managed by by your coach or by your SNC coach, and then secondly trying to evolve every time you play. And, and I think that is one of the secrets of every good rugby player, is uh, a never stop learning mentality. Mm. If you can keep on doing that, you know, and evolve the game it's a great game to play there's so many different facets of the game and if you, uh, I've never mastered any of that but if you strive to master that then um, you're off with it Mm. I mean, you speak about that evolution, Skull. In terms of what you do differently on the field, is that largely, do you feel instinctive or is a lot of that kind of come down to decision-making from a personal perspective? Can you can you kind of quantify that? Um, it's quite tough. It, it's, it starts with playing touch on the beach and it probably is playing touch on grass and enjoying the game. Mm. It's never been a thought process. You can't think before and you're going to offload. It's more of you see the opportunity and you take it. It's, I'm quite an instinctive player, but of course you try to do it in a, in a setup and a system that suits the back on a play, and specifically where you are on the pitch. Mm. So I think from that point of view, it's, it's something that we do from from a young age. And Matthew Said in his book about ten thousand hours, I think that plays a big part of it. If you keep on seeing the same picture over and over again, it's just the different coloured jerseys, but the picture stays the same. So mm. if you can make more correct decisions that you become better with it and uh, hopefully through my career I've made more good decisions than bad decisions. (laughs) Now, your work at the Laureus Foundation, Skull Kano, is, is very dear to you. Um, it's seen you infuse kids and adults with your, your sort of infectious spirit. What has being an ambassador given to you and perhaps what kind of relevance does it have for your family too in terms of how you guys live your life? Firstly, I, I, I think it is amazing to see what sport can do. Just from a, from a being a young kid in 95, literally, I know, I know rugby is a big part of being a South African, but how it can unify a country like South Africa in 95 where everyone was running around hugging and celebrating the victory of the Springboks. 
Uh, and then personally, my experience, actually helping lawyers has given me so much more than I guess the lawyers got. It's uh, firstly uh, how privileged I am and the position I am and what change you can do to people's lives. Even just sitting down and having a chat and um, being interested in their lives. That, that is quite, quite special from their point of view. The one thing that I am scared of is, is actually at the end of June, I'm supposed to do a, a, a ride from London to, to Amsterdam on a bicycle. I haven't been training at all. I haven't done anything. So doing 340 k's on a bike is going to be, is, is it's already nerve-wracking. So hopefully I can get some kind of practice in and still do this. Well, good luck with that. Listen, um, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of uh, quick-fire questions if I can. So are you ready? Yes, let's go. Favorite player other than yourself? South South. Time's up. Penalty to win the game. Who's taking it for you? Me. Biggest regret? Uh, not having more fun. Jean de Villiers or Skulk Burger and why? Well, and golf and beer wise, definitely Skulk Burger. Better golfer, better drinker. Uh, he can tell a couple of beers. Okay. So Jean de Villiers okay. for, for, for the amount of jokes he can. Uh, it's just fun being around. Okay, and final one best nose, pre op, Shark Burger or Kelly Brown? Uh, Jean Burger by far got the worst nose. I mean, I, I need to put Aaron Sebe in that bracket as well. Um, his <laughs> his, his uh, nose is ridiculous. What an incredible story that is. We genuinely do wish him all the success in retirement and his further studies at Oxford. Although at this point, don't be hugely surprised if somehow he sneaks a seat on the plane to Japan next year. That's it for this episode of The Power of Sport. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Stand by for another episode due out shortly. We will be hearing from Luke Lamprecht from the Fight with Insight project. We are going on a hugely exciting exchange to Rio in late June. Remember to find us on Twitter, Facebook, and we're on Instagram too. Cheers for now.